get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a peach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of RX Bar, which actually end up selling for $600 million to Kellogg. Uh, P90X, Tony Horton talks about how he made money as a street mime before he sold hundreds of millions of dollars. Because I love hearing a little like the, the crappy stories, you know, the challenge stories <laughs> that people go through. And I felt like yeah. when, I, when I listened to Shoe Dog, um, it was like entrepreneurial therapy for me because, mm-hmm. oh, if he went through all this, these challenges and crap, it like makes feel, me feel better. Yeah, it's okay for me. <laughs> so, yeah, somehow, some way. Um, the founder of Baby Einstein, how she overcame uh, cancer twice and the founder of Atari, how he lost everything and ended up traveling, every, you know, all over Europe. Um, so just some interesting stories and, um, this one's going to be much the same. Uh, this episode is brought to you by rise 25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. And our mission is to connect people with their best referral partners and customers. We do that through, uh, several done for you services, which is a done for you event solution. We partner with large conferences or software companies and bring their highest level people into a room. We do that with our Done For You podcast services where we help people connect to their best referral partners and clients and uh, Done For You lead generation service. And Laura knows this perfectly because she has a Done For You book service, among other things, which we'll talk about. And so she totally believes uh, helping people connect with their customers, referral partners, whoever in at scale with your book. Um, and you know, we have a mission behind Rise 25, which is um, if you go to rise25.com slash mission, which is our veteran entrepreneur scholarship. So every event that we do, we look at our database of people who applied and we choose someone to um, come. And last time when we did one at um, Digital Marketers, no longer Digital Marketers, but Traffic and Conversion because they sold it. But um, we did one there and we had someone, we, we are able to get them a ticket to our VIP event, a ticket to the show, flight, hotel, and food stipend. Um, and they were super appreciative. And so, um, if, if you know a veteran entrepreneur, um, or you are one yourself, go to rise25.com slash mission and apply. There's a long story behind why that is with my grandfather and my business partner's grandfather. So we'll leave that for another time. But Laura, I'm excited to have Laura, you know, we uh, are in several groups together. We see each other a lot and I highly respect her work and I wanted to have her on and we have Laura Gale and she got her start as a publicist for Hachette. How do you pronounce it? Hachette, that's right. Hachette, yeah. which is a global publishing house and uh, she worked on projects like the Twilight Phenomenon, J.K. Rowling's Post Harry Potter Publications. The personal memoirs of Michael Palin, Nelson Mandela, and Tina Fey. Amazing. Uh, She was born and raised in Australia, and she started Gale Creative to help entrepreneurs and marketers to write, publish, and market books that transform their businesses. And Laura is also the author. You know, she practices what she preaches. She eats her own dog food. So she's the author of Content That Converts, How to Build a Profitable and Predictable B2B Content Marketing Strategy. And I um, just try and convince her to get it on Audible and also to create a, a course out of this so I can actually consume it in, <laughs> it's in, all in, coming. in it's video all coming. form, audio <laughs> form. So probably by the time this comes up, it maybe is available in that format too. She also has a book, um, which I love the title, um, How to Write This Book. You know, someone told me, Laura, that it sells more books. I don't know if this is true. Maybe you know. If you actually show the book to people, whether it's TV <laughs> or not. So ever since hearing that, if I have an author and if I have the book, I show the book, maybe it will sell more books. I don't know if that works or not. But so how, right, how to write this book, write, publish, and market your business bestseller. She's helped people like our good friend and colleague, mentor Brian Kurtz with Over Deliver, Marcella Allison, Russ Perry, and many more. What are the two? What are their two book titles with Russ and Marcella? 
Uh, Marcelo's book is Why Didn't Anybody Tell Me This Shit Before, which is a collection of stories from female entrepreneurs sort of sharing the lessons that mm. they have collected along the way. And Russ Perry's first book was called The Sober Entrepreneur, and we've just finished his second book, the which is going to be called... Yes, okay. correct. Um, it's about his journey from having a fairly chaotic business and personal life um, in the wake of a pretty serious alcohol addiction to mm. building an extremely successful design company um, that now hires hundreds of people and, and serves thousands and thousands of companies. So he's got a really fascinating story and it was mm. really fun to work with him. So I'm looking forward to digging into this. And you can check all her stuff out at lauraiswriting.com. Um, Laura, thanks for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. It's very exciting. You know, so I want to, we'll fast forward to the, you know, right now, what's going on with how to write this book. But I wanted to talk about, because you have a really amazing past uh, experience. And so I wanted to dig into kind of separate the projects and then the personal memoirs side. What are some of the lessons you learned from Twilight Phenomenon <laughs> and working on J.K. Rowling's post Harry Potter stuff? And you could do both of them. Uh, I don't mm -hmm. know what sticks out to you. So I came on board with this publishing house just as the Twilight stuff was taking off. And it was just, I mean, it was a juggernaut. Nobody predicted mm. at all how well that book was going to do and how well all of the series would do. And honestly, it was a lesson in being adaptable because we could not keep the books in mm. stock no matter what we did. That's it a was great just, problem, right? It's a huge, I mean, it's an amazing problem, but it's a huge problem. Because, <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, traditional publishing, the, the production cycle, cycle takes a while. And mm. so we had to come up with some really creative ways to keep the fans engaged and um, patient, but also to, mm. to speed up that supply chain and, and kind of meet the demand in a way that the company just hadn't had to face before. Um, How'd you keep fans engaged? So we did a lot of events and a lot of, um, we did sort of um, online events where the author was talking to people. We did um, in-person meetups for fans. There were all kinds of, it was very interactive and because the audience for that book was quite young, they're very open to experience. And so they, they're not like, oh, I'm not going to go and hang out with other fans at this book. That's weird. Like they're, you know, 15 year old girls. So they're like, of course I want to go and hang out. And so it's like a good lesson as well in like understanding the psychology of your market and, right. and, you know, looking at them a little bit objectively. And I, you know, I think in marketing, there's always this conversation about get into the mind of your audience and really try to empathize with them and everything. And I think, you know, there's always a place for that, but objectively, what do you know about teenage girls? They love just like hanging out with their friends and mm. and being in the midst. Personally, of Personally, like, I know little to nothing. But, you know. <laughs> <Right. laughs> but I mean, you can pick that up even from you know just cultural tropes. But uh, you know, really understanding that they were super excited about this thing and it didn't really matter what you did. It was the fact that you were doing something and just you know, being appreciative of how enthusiastic they were and not sort of wasting that energy that they were bringing to it. So it was, yeah, that, that whole project, everybody had to be very adaptable mm. and very um, creative. Um, working on uh, J.K. Rowling stuff, so Harry Potter was published by a different house, but when she finished that series, uh, we took over her adult fiction. And so A Casual Vacancy was the first book that she published after Harry Potter. And so, of course, mm. there was this immense amount of expectation and pressure and, and you know, everybody was kind of on tenterhooks waiting to see what this book was going to be like. Um, and so that was a great lesson in anticipation and how anticipation can be developed and used to ensure that a launch goes very well, but yeah. also just how responsive people are to... Um, being sort of drip fed good material. Mm. So, you know, she, there were like epic wars among the newspapers to get the first interview with her and mm. to get an exclusive interview. And so, you know, there were book embargoes. So, you know, people, all of the booksellers would get the books at exactly the same moment. It was this huge mm. logistical engineering feat. Mm. How to do they do that? All of the books. It was 
it was an undertaking. I have to say they hired all these fleets of trucks and they, you know, everybody had to sign NDAs and there were specific drop points and times. And like, it was just this huge, like undercover operation so that everybody would get the book at the same time and no one could sell it in advance of anybody else. And, Mm. um, and this was coordinated worldwide. So, you know, there was a moment in history basically when this book became available and, you know, people were lining up at bookstores in the middle of the night to get it. And, It just was, it was fascinating to watch how much anticipation her name brought to that project. Nobody knew what the book was going to be about. Nobody knew, I mean, there was like the back cover blurb, but, you know, very, very hidden. Um, And so it was really fascinating to watch how much influence a brand like that can have. Mm. because she is a brand, right? And she's a very appealing brand. She's very um, down to earth. And I think, like you said about Shoe Dog, she's very relatable because she struggled so hard to get Harry Potter written and published. And she has this amazing life story. But um, it was a great lesson in building up, you know, ensuring that event that an event goes really well and has a huge payoff simply by restricting the amount of information that is available around it so what did you have to do around that that launch and around that that book release so i was working in publicity so i was dealing with all of the media on on the end of that so basically organizing all of the um events that were going on around it a lot of places wanted to have like launch events um arranging interviews and book Mm -hmm. reviews and uh she decided that she wasn't going to tour, so we didn't have to manage a, a book tour. But um, basically, I was sort of the interface between her little team, sort of managing her end, and, and the media mm. for the Australian side of it. So she was, was she doing um, just over the phone interviews? So she wasn't, was she going in person? She wasn't doing like an in-person tour, or she would still do some of the larger publications? Some of the large publications she did, I believe, in-person interviews um, in the UK. So she went to London and I think did, you know, the BBC and, you know, a couple of the like very big newspapers. And then a lot of that material got syndicated. But again, it was, you know, there were sort of all of these exclusivity deals about who could run the interviews and when and where. And Mm. um, so there was just kind of a lot of operational wrangling. Logistics, yeah. Yeah. Did you have to go on any of the interviews or no? No, no. No, okay. <laughs> no. What about the memoir side of things? <clears throat> like the Nelson Mandela, Tina Fey, Michael Palin, any... Um... I mean, the the production of memoirs is a very interesting process, um, partly because every publisher wants to release a memoir at a moment where there's a lot of buzz around the author already. And so... You know, obviously, like Nelson Mandela and Michael Palin are much older, and so there's kind of always this, like, you know, Do you want to get it out. exciting. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But you've got to balance that with, you know, of course, the demands of the rest of their career. And, um, you know, working on the Tina Fey book was was really interesting because she was sort of in full swing when Bossy Pants came out, and she had been doing um, uh, Thirty Rock, and she was starting to get into you know, doing more film and she was sort of this meteoric rising star. And so again, there was a huge, you know, embargo situation and, um, same things, you know, just everything had to be super well coordinated and everybody wanted exclusive deals. And, you know, it was, it just takes a lot of, um, publicity is very much about relationship management. And so, uh, I sort of, I was working with another publicist, you know, fortunately I was not on my own in that realm, but, um, you know, you have to spend a lot of time building up great relationships with the media and Mm -hmm. making sure that those relationships are well cared for. And and a lot of that is going into bat for them when maybe there's somewhere that would be easier or, um, more obvious for an author to go. But, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of, uh, yeah, it's it's a very relational business. So I want to hear more about the building relationships, what you did to build those relationships and then go to bat for them because I was just <clears throat> with Perry Marshall discussing this and his his roundtable group. And that's 
you know, what I think is the key to anything really is relationships. And so I talked about the 80-20 of relationship building. And that to me is the foundation for everything I do. And I know what you do. What were some of the things you learned at that point? How did you build those relationships with those those different media channels and actually maintain it and manage it? Or what's um, something that sticks out to you? I have always found the most effective way to build lasting relationships is to get in the same room as the person. Hmm. And it's one thing to send an email or make a phone call or whatever, but until you have put eyes on them and, you know, shaken hands and, and had a joke around over some coffee or whatever, it's, it's hard to, for that person to think of you as anything, but just like another voice trying to get their attention. Um, I was listening yesterday to an interview, um, uh, Brian Koppelman's uh, podcast, The Moment, he was interviewing General Stanley McChrystal and McChrystal was talking about coordinating thousands of people, um, you know, in military situations where there needs to be an, an overflow of information, but everybody's very siloed. And so until you can get people in a room, there's this us versus mm-hmm. them kind of dynamic that can right. really solidify and it stops the flow of information. And so I think that's something that I ended up kind of doing intuitively by feel because I just wasn't getting anywhere by sending emails and, and making phone calls. You know, what would you do? Were you in Australia hundreds. at the time? Yeah, this was in Sydney. And so I would find out where somebody worked. So say I wanted to get an interview with a journalist at the Australian newspaper. I would find out where they worked, like which department they were in at their um, newspaper, write them a note, like a handwritten note, Mm. send it to them and then follow up a couple of days later with um, a phone call just saying like, hey, did you get my note? Do you want to grab a coffee this week? Um, So I would go over to them, you know, make it super easy for them, go to the closest coffee shop to their building, buy them a coffee, just sit sit down, ask them about what they're interested in writing about. Um, And, you know, often people are responsible for a specific type of book or a specific type of media, different uh, specific type of content. And so you kind of want to go with stuff that's already relevant to them. So you can't just turn up and be like, hey, you tell me what you need. You sort of need to turn up being like, I know what you need. I've put in the effort to research it. Mm -hmm. I have a clear sense of the kind of stuff that you already like to work on. Of course, you don't want to go in and be like, I know everything about you. Um, but like so, creepy. Yeah. I have pictures <laughs> on my wall in my bedroom. Yeah, you want to be sort of like, I've done my homework. I'm not like turning <laughs> up at your house tonight. Um, so going with some ideas uh, about what they could do with material that you've got coming up. So say I have three books in the next six months that are going to be relevant for them. I don't want to be pitching them anything else. Like, I just want their focus to be... Yeah. You want to understand what their focus is and then yeah, deliver something yeah. as relevant and, to and them. And go with some ideas about what they could do with it because, you know, they get hundreds of pitches every week. And if they have to come up with the new idea, the cool angle for every single project, that's exhausting. And so if you can go clearly differentiated already because you've made the effort to turn up, you've made the effort to do your research... And you go with some hooks or some headlines or some, mm. you know, cool angles. You make about their job as easy as humanly possible. Make it easy. Them. Yeah. It just, you know, at that point, all they have to do is say yes. And it's, Like, I just wrote the article for you. Here you go. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I would do this. I would write a headline and some key, like, body ideas and, and just... Be like, here's some stuff I thought that might be useful. You know, I've had a chance to talk with the author. They think that this could be a cool approach or whatever. And so you go and just hand them kind of a ready-made thing. They just have to join the dots, Mm -hmm. you know, just – and I I try still to do that with with people. You know, whenever I'm starting a new project, I want to get as much research done on the client as I can. I want to know everything about their previous work. You know, the more information I have, the better because I can just go to them and be like, here's my assessment of everything that we should be talking about is there anything else that you think we should add? And they can go, oh, yeah, we need to add ABC. Or, no, you got it all, let's start. Like, it Mm. just makes it really easy. So I want to talk about, Laura, the craziest thing you've done to get a hold of someone or build a relationship. (laughs) But before we talk about that, I'll give you a second to think about it. But um, I know, like me, you kind of geek out on the direct response marketing and you mentioned headlines. And when did you first really start to decide this is a priority i want to start to study or work with or learn from some of the the greats of of direct response 
Um, I think it was probably 2011. Mm -hmm. um, the publishing industry was really struggling at the time. The industry as a whole sort of hadn't learned from the music industry and hadn't seen how much digital was going to affect the industry. And so mm -hmm. a lot of people were um, being laid off and all of this sort of thing. And so while I still had a job and I was reasonably successful, I sort of felt like I need to get a little bit more autonomy in my career situation. And so I thought, you know, I already know how to write. Maybe I will learn to write stuff for online. And everybody has the same idea, right? You know, there's countless people that are writing content online. And so there had to be a way to kind of stand out a bit from that and to right. uh, produce material that was going to be effective for the people I was writing for. And so um, someone gave me uh, a couple of book recommendations. There was Claude Hopkins, Scientific Advertising, mm -hmm. and um, a couple of the other kind of great... Oh, what are your favorites? I mean, Scientific Advertising is up there. Mm -hmm. um, Ogilvy on Advertising, very, mm -hmm. very insightful. Um, over -delivered. And then I No, at the time that wasn't <laughs> no. out. You had to write <laughs> yeah. that one. Help write it that one. It would have been awesome if I had yeah. that at the time. <laughs> um, but I went through a program called Copy Hour, which is basically you spend a couple of months writing yeah. copy by hand and you sort of learn by doing, just by emulating what really great copywriters have produced in the past. And so that gave me a really strong foundation. So when I started writing for clients and, and producing some of my own stuff online, it just meant that there was a much clearer next step for the audience, which I think makes a really big difference. You can kind of lead people to an action, which uh, I think differentiates whether or not you're going to thrive as a writer. You know, it's, it's one thing to be able to give somebody a great piece of content, but if they just absorb it and then forget about it, then you've kind of wasted that attention. You know, if you can lead them then to a next action, whether that's a consult or a service or whatever, um, that's kind of where the the real momentum comes from. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I, those are amazing books. Um, one of my favorites is uh, Joe Sugarman's book. I think I have it here, actually. Um, yeah, Adweek Copywriting Handbook. I thought that was, <laughs> that's one of my favorites. It's just so simple. You know, it's just like, What's the goal of the headline? To get him the subhead. What's the goal of the subhead? Yeah. To get him to the first <laughs> sentence. It's like, okay, yeah. that makes sense, you know. <laughs> um, so craziest thing you've done to get a hold of someone or build a relationship. I remember I was talking to a, a Gary Halbert protege and it was like midnight and we were, you know, exciting topic of what's the best lumpy mail package you've ever got received or <laughs> sent and we talked for an hour about that but so i'm curious yeah. for you what is something out of the ordinary you've done <laughs> to build a relationship or well, to get a hold of someone i i mean i sent a lot of lumpy mail when i was mm -hmm. in publicity mm -hmm. um because you get proof copies of a book so obviously you maybe get 100 copies that you can send to media and whatever mm -hmm. to get sort of early buzz um and so this was always one of my favorite parts of that job was coming up with a cool way to send these books. Because, mm -hmm. you know, you can just stick it in an envelope and send it. That's right. fine. But boring. And so, you know, one thing we had a guy called uh, Justin Cronin who wrote a book called The Passage, um, which is a fantastic trilogy for fans of like zombie and apocalyptic mm. like stuff. Amazing. Um, but a big part of that book was the role of sunlight. And so, um, you know, when the, when the light went out, then all the bad things happened. And mm. so we, I went out and bought a ton of candles and uh, wrapped up the each book in like a really scrappy old piece of paper, which looked like it had just been through a wasteland um, and tied a candle up in it and like on the book and wrote this like kind of, desperate handwriting like don't let the lights go out <laughs> <laughs> like stephen um, king movie that was yeah 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 um and then sort of had them all hand delivered to to these journalists so that got a lot of interest just because you know it's just a bit different um it's it's not like a really crazy like haven't it's a fun creative way it's it's yeah. fun, you know um it'd freak me I, out i'd be like i'm not 
touching this thing. <laughs> Some psychos. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, a lot of it, in terms of like the craziest thing I've done to get in touch with somebody, I've definitely gone down a lot of rabbit holes on the internet to find out where I can send stuff to people because mm. I just want to be able to, like Lumpy Mail, I think, and this is why books are also so powerful, is that it just gets past gatekeepers, right? Like no one is going to stop a personal package to their boss or to the higher up, you know, because everyone wants to get that stuff, right? And so if you have something cool to send them, uh, it sort of automatically brings a lot of the defenses down. So I spend a lot of time finding the right places to send stuff to mm. people. <laughs> um, you did some work for companies for online content too, mm -hmm. um, like Natural Stacks. I talked to Roy and Dave, this amazing story you should check out. Um, and the, the opener of that interview is one of my favorites because I I don't remember if they talked about it at the time, but they had, they'd had they sponsored that World Series of Poker player. Yeah. So I pipe in the video from that. So if you just check out even the first minute of that, it's remarkable. You know, it's yeah, featured it's on ESPN. Um, yeah. They did a whole documentary on it. What were some of the things that worked um, as far as the writing goes for content marketing for like an e-commerce company? Um, again, it's kind of looking at the audience and trying to understand what they are trying to get out of this purchase. Um, working with Natural Stacks was really fun because I also uh, had a very studious time early in my life. And so when I was at, at um, the publishing house, I also did a nutrition degree um, studying at night. And so working with natural sex was kind of a perfect blend because I got to use both parts of my interest. And so I was sort of looking at what are people looking to get out of, say, a Siltep, which is the supplement that the um, poker player was using when he right. won that um, world championship. Like, it's what like it a was, cognitive enhancer, what yeah, you'd say, yeah, yeah, a neuro, it's, it's neurotropic. It's whatever exactly, the term exactly. is. Exactly, sort yeah. of just like makes you very sharp, sort of like a caffeine, but without the jittery, you know, side effects. Yeah. Um, and so trying to think about what people are aiming for, because it's not like, I want to have greater cognitive function. That's not what is... They don't care about that, like, yeah. They don't care about they that. They want they're a result. Like, yeah, they're like, I want to impress my boss tomorrow, or I am drowning in the amount of work I have to do. I need something that's going to make me go faster. Like it's, you know, trying to understand what their real underlying reason is and then what the emotion is underneath that reason because you know i think um i once read that humans have five key emotions and it's fear anger sadness desire and joy and so if you can kind of hmm. niche down to like what the the story they are telling themselves is and then dig even further under that and identify what that emotion is then it makes it much easier to create content that speaks directly to that emotion and it makes them feel like you know them better than they know themselves because a lot of people haven't been like oh i want to impress my boss tomorrow underneath that i'm scared that he's going to be mad at me or that mm. i'm not going to be doing a good job or whatever and so if you can kind and then of get i may get that, fired right yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly don't get fired buy silt up <laughs> <laughs> maybe not that fine a point yeah okay them, but, you know it's it's if you can identify people's feelings for them and say like, here's why this is the right solution because it speaks specifically to that key emotion that you're having and people are, are very receptive and um, it's very easy to kind of lead them in the right direction. There's a lot of responsibility with that and I talk a lot with people about the ethical uh, responsibility that you have in marketing to make sure that armed with that knowledge, you're not abusing people, but, um, you know, it was a really great opportunity in content marketing to really learn across multiple different industries um, what's motivating people. Because at the end of the day, all of what we do here is about people's emotions. You know, that's kind of what it comes down to. And so if you understand that at a fundamental level, you'll always be able to get a result. So how was the shift from working at a company to breaking out on your own? Did you do that? Was that a gradual process? Because I know you saw, you kind of saw this trend of the publishing companies and the new media. And you, it seems like you were trying to equip yourself to prepare for that. I guess kind of like a survivalist. You're like packing stuff <laughs> in a case. Not like the same thing, but 
Um, what was that transition like for you? Was it cold turkey? Was it slow? So initially it was cold turkey. I quit the publishing house and went out on my own. I was writing about nutrition stuff. Um, there was, I was seeing a lot online of like bodybuilding competitors or like extreme athletes and there was nothing for your sort of average person. And so I wanted to sort of fill that space where there's, um, you know, most people are residing. And so sort of started creating a lot of content around that um, and then realized that nobody wants to be average. And every, the reason that all of these products online were about these very extreme things is because people want to be remarkable. And mm. so um, that business did not go great. It's interesting. <laughs> um, and so part of the process was being like, okay, why isn't this working? What do I need to understand to make a business work, um, specifically if I'm going to be writing a lot? Um, and so going into content marketing was a really good way of learning all of that stuff. I kind of got to um, apply in practice everything that I'd learned in theory from all of those books and from Copy Hour, and it really made me internalize um, a bunch of stuff. So I was doing mostly retainer work with a large group of clients so I was writing across a, a lot of different industries um, so yeah it sort of went cold turkey workers uh, work on retainer with a bunch of different people I worked with natural stacks for a year exclusively and then um, kind of came to the end of that and somebody asked me to help them write a book and I had this light bulb moment of like I have all of the skills to write a book. You know, I did a degree in writing and publishing. Um, I've worked in publishing industry. I know exactly what that process is. Um, I love writing, but I get really, um, I was getting agitated writing really short form stuff. <laughs> because you can't get like deep into something. Um, and so a book kind of felt like this perfect solution. And since then, that's all I've done. You Why know, did I've they ask you? What, what, what prompted that? Uh... So the first one was a book about life insurance, which on the surface seems Sexy. very boring. Um, but the guy, Jeff Root, is, uh, he's a life insurance agent, but he saw the same thing, this huge digital transformation coming down on the industry and decided that he would teach other life insurance agents um, how to run their business online. Because, you know, that's a very, it's basically dotted or sales, um, that industry originally. And so to be able to set up a website and, you know, have a, have a chat bot and all of this stuff where it's a whole new world for a lot of people. It's groundbreaking um, for them. Yeah, exactly. And so he basically wanted to have a book um, as kind of the interface between the old world and the new world, um, teaching people that here's all of this stuff that you need to do. Here's my credibility piece because I've written a book. I'm an established author. Um, and, you know, at the end of that book, they were, um, the call to action was to come and be part of his membership community. And so um, it was kind of a cool experiment to see direct response being transplanted into the book world. Um, and I was just totally hooked. Um, yeah. Why I, did I he got, ask you? How did you know um, I was in a forum online um, called the Dynamite Circle, which was a like online entrepreneurs um, forum. Basically, it was I think the tagline was like curing entrepreneurial loneliness. Um, it was very much oriented to people who were sort of working on their own and had these little right. businesses, but um, were doing fine, but you know needed other people around them. And so he and I had been in that for a while and. I'd done quite a lot of content work for a lot of people in that community and someone said to him, you know, he was throwing this idea around and someone said, well, it sounds like long form content marketing. So why don't you ask Laura if she can do it? Mm. And, you know, that's. Yeah. I want to talk about Laura, your book and then some of the people you've helped with their book. Um, but is it, <clears throat> would you call yourself um, a ghostwriter? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I feel like I was thinking about this in the car the other day and I was thinking that's sort of a tough position, you know, um, to be in sometimes because, or challenging in some ways because you're, you, people want to keep you as their best kept secret. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's just what I was thinking about. And, you know, you're not on people's, but you're, you know, you help them and probably drag the content out of them sometimes 
But um, what's their sentiments usually of sharing you that you help them or not and giving credit or not? I know, obviously, Brian Kurtz doesn't care at all. He's like, Laura's amazing. <laughs> she helped me with over deliver. And he shouts you from the rooftops. But I imagine there's there's many people who, you know, it's just you're in the background. Like, this is my book and I'm the star and I'm really, you know, not going to share the limelight. So there's probably a lot of people you can't share who you've worked with. Are, is that what's more typical? More typically, people are happy to acknowledge my help. Mm. Um, I'm not on, you know, the cover of most of the books, but I'm always in the acknowledgements. Mm -hmm. um, my over the years, my view of my role is to enable growth in the entrepreneurial community by helping entrepreneurs tell their stories. And so many entrepreneurs have gone down because they just didn't know what they didn't know. And I hate to see that. And it's just such a waste to me. And so I'm not really bothered by not being front and center mm -hmm. because the purpose for me is more about getting that information out there. Mm -hmm. You know, it, if you can shortcut somebody's learning curve, then the impact they are able to have in the world just becomes mm -hmm. exponential. And so um, I'm not that worried about it. Most of the time, um, people are very open about yeah. having worked with me. Some will say, you know, she's my developmental editor or she's my book doctor or she's my mm. you know, publishing yeah. consultant or whatever. Um, the, the term ghostwriter, I think, still has like a funny mm. connotation to it. You know, it's got this very like back room vibe. <laughs> right. Um, but, you know, most of the time people are very upfront about that. And, mm. you know, I always uh, negotiate that I will be able to uh, use the book that we produce together as a way of marketing my services. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm not necessarily shouting it from the rooftops that I worked with so and so and, and some people I will be a little bit more um, discreet about discreet yeah. about um, but people who have been very public in acknowledging that we've worked together like Brian I think you know yeah. it's, it's fine one skill that you have that's tremendous and you have to when you have a book uh, when you're when you're helping someone um, write a book is pulling out the best content and stories um, and that's what makes everything interesting. So I'm really curious of some of the, the methods or ways you get the best stories out of people when you're so talking to them. A big part of this, and you, you would know from doing this show, is doing your research. Because mm. people talk a lot about all kinds of things, but they, I think, often find themselves with a very polished spiel about how they ended up where they are. And so I always want to find the weak spots in that spiel and like pull on it a little bit mm. <laughs> um, because that's where the interesting stories are. You know, you can sort of say, well, I saw the writing on the wall and it was time to make a change in my career. And so I learned to do copywriting and now I write books and like, that's all very easy to say, but okay, like how long did that take you? What, like, where did you fail? You know, what, who was your first client? What was that about? Like, what was your psyche at that time? You know, there's, there's so many questions that you can ask. Mm in all of those little spiels. And so I try to listen to interviews they've done and read the content they've produced. Um, but mostly I ask them a question and shut up. Um, the power of silence is astounding in getting people to mm. tell you stuff <laughs> because they just fill people the space. are super uncomfortable in silence. And so they will just keep talking. <laughs> So if you can ask an interesting question that they don't have to answer very often and so they think about it a little bit and then just like wait, hmm. they'll keep talking. Interesting. So, yeah. And so you do a lot of research that helps you get some of the best stories because you see some of the, the where they didn't add color to something mm -hmm. and kind of yeah. point that out and have them expand on it. Um, yeah. But a lot of it also, you know, I do a lot of structural work before we get into actually producing the material you know we plan the we're very clear about the strategy of the book the role the book is going to play in the business's marketing ecosystem i really want a robust structure and a very clear sense of where we're going 
with the material before we start ever doing interviews for it or anything like that because um, it's very easy in these kinds of conversations to get on tangents that might be very interesting but are completely irrelevant to mm. the book. You know, mm. there may be very educational or insightful but maybe that's for a different book and you've got to be able to filter the material you get to make sure that the final product is as polished and focused as possible um so a lot of it is preparing myself in a way you know orienting myself to the right kinds of questions and Mm. making sure that i'm following the right threads not just the interesting threads right Um, yeah, so you kind of have to map it out, like in the life insurance example. Like if he starts talking about some story about there's nothing to do with taking life insurance to the digital age, it may be mm. interesting, but you may kind of throw it out and kind of focus them back on to what the goal yeah. is. Yeah, and that can be hard for, for the client a lot of the time because, you know, the the reason these books are interesting is that it's not always just about the business. You know, it's very much about their life. And for a lot of people, this is their life's work. And... So it's very difficult to hear somebody say that's not relevant. And so <laughs> <laughs> that story about your mom, not relevant, <laughs> not really coming to the point here. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, a lot of it is just making sure that I am being respectful and empathetic to their experience, but also making sure I sort of shepherd them to the right material. Mm. Um, Cause in the end it doesn't serve them to have, interesting but useless information in their book um so yeah a lot of it is just making sure that i'm sort of in my in my element and we're we're all prepared and um yeah just being willing to listen and and keep asking questions i know one of the biggest things for you is and you have a lot of opinions on this matter is when you have a book um how do you best launch the book and I know it starts before you actually finish the book, but what's what's some of the kind of the timeline that you look at with, with launching the book? So whenever I start talking to a new client, I ask them to start marketing immediately hmm. um, because say it takes us three or four months to write the book. Um, there is so much material that is going to get produced in that time that they can use to start building that anticipation that we talked about earlier. And so, you know, if you can drip out little bits of interesting content, not only does it prime your audience to be ready for the main event, it also will bring new people to your audience. And so it's kind of a a virtuous cycle in that you're teaching and sharing a lot of valuable information, um, which kind of primes people to think like, if this is what they're teaching now before the book is even here, imagine how good that's going to be. Um, and so it kind of just puts people in the right frame of mind. There's a lot obviously with social media that you can do with the, you know, we do interviews like this, you know, a couple of times a week for a few hours, there is a lot of good material that you can chop up and use for social media and for your email list and for opt-in material and all that kind of thing. And I, I'm a big believer in, Uh, having a multi-purpose approach to your content. So if you are going to write a book, great, but you can also use a couple of the chapters as blog posts. You can also use the interviews as YouTube material. You can have voice recordings and make a podcast season out of it. There's so much stuff that you can do with that material. It's such a waste if it's just used one way Mm. Um, because not everybody learns the same way. Um, like you were saying before, some people are going to do better with an audiobook. Some people are going to learn better through doing a course. You know, a lot of people will respond better to video than to reading. Um, you know, so you kind of have to meet your audience where they're at a little bit and give them the options um, that are going to work best for them. So I, I think that's part of marketing the book is understanding how all of that information needs to be presented differently. Um, the actual launch is, is really no different to any other product launch. You want to make sure that you have um, an enthusiastic audience that has been primed for the launch. You want to have some micro commitments along the way where they maybe put in a pre-order or they commit to coming onto a webinar or they, you know, people show commitment with their wallets and with their calendars. And so you want to get them saying yes to you um, in advance of the book coming out so that when you launch it and it's available and you ask them to make a purchase, then it's a natural thing for them to say yes and to feel good about that. Um, 
obviously there's kind of all of the regular stuff. You can do affiliates, um, you can do social media, there's email campaigns, there's lumpy mail campaigns. And I really recommend um, lumpy mail, particularly when your audience is kind of an affluent um, group. You know, they're used to getting lots of advertising and all this kind of thing. But lumpy mail, like we said before, is a really great way to kind of cut past any gatekeepers and to be a bit more, a uh, bit of a pattern interrupt in their day. Um, the other great thing with books is that they tend to be evergreen. So it's not like you have to launch it once and be done with it. You can launch it every month if you want to with different campaigns, you know, and I talk about this a lot with people like start with the stuff that you're good at and that you like doing. So if you like podcasting, then do a whole podcast season on your book, you know, interview people who are related to it and make it a really focused thing that you do and just do it really well. And then once you're done with that, then move on to doing something else. You know, you don't have to do it all simultaneously because the lifetime of a book is very long. Um, and so you can re-release extra editions later down the line if you want to. You can produce new material related to the book. There's so many things you can do, but people get kind of psyched out about launching books. Um, and I just tell people, like, do as much as you can with the resources that you have at the time, but keep an eye on the long tail because mm. you can you can do something new every month for, you know, an indefinite period of time. So, um, and Amazon particularly, um, you know, for people who are self-publishing, Amazon is, is obviously the giant in this space, but the more consistent your sales are, the more the book is recommended. And so there's actually a pretty strong argument for keeping some of your powder dry early on. So launch, but keep some campaigns for mm. the next couple of months so that you can kind of get that sustained sales velocity, um, which in turn will improve the, uh, the sales velocity over the lifetime of the book. You have an opinion, self-published versus publisher. I think both have their place. Self-publishing is my preferred option because it allows you to retain all creative control of the project. For marketers and entrepreneurs particularly, this is very important because you probably got a lot of ideas about how you want to put the book to use. And if you have a traditional publisher, there will be instances that you will not be able to do what you want with it. Um, particularly in the case, you know, if you're kind of a, a brand name, as happened with JK Rowling, if they decide to embargo the book, no one gets it until launch day. And so that's very difficult to use for any marketing uh, you don't want to be breaking any rules about who gets what and when, you know, there's an extraordinary amount of reach that a traditional publisher can generate for you. And there's still a lot of cachet in having one of the big publishing houses take you on, but it also extends the light, the timeline for the project significantly. Um, for most people, if you go with a finished book, you know, it's, it's written, it's edited, it's pretty much done, you'll still wait a year before your book is in the market, hmm. um, often at least. And your because, timeline looks like? Uh, I mean, if we start today, it will be in the market within six months. Um, so, and, and you get to kind of retain all of the control over the title and the cover, how it's marketed, how you use it before the launch, how you use it after the launch. You get to buy it at cost, which is another big factor. Um, you know, if you go through a publishing house, then they will have a say on the cover and the title, how it's marketed, what you can do with it before and after the launch date. There becomes, um, it becomes a much more restricted process for the author. Um, mm. For, for a novelist or, or somebody who is not using their book as a marketing tool for their business, I think that going with a publisher is, is probably an ideal scenario um, if you're looking for um, not just the money. Like if you're interested in being part of the literary community or you're wanting to be famous in some way or you think that it would make a good movie, then really, yes, you do need to have a publisher. Hmm. Um but if you're looking to retain as much control of the project as you can, and a lot of um, novelists um, are doing this as well, where you know you can write an entire series of books, release them on Amazon on you know any given day, 
and you'll have a ready-made audience who buy all six of your books um, because you've released them simultaneously. They don't have to wait a year or two or three for the next one to come out. Mm. And this is kind of an interesting overflow effect of Netflix and the kind of binge watching pattern that we're all into now. Like people want to binge read. And so that traditional publishing model where you drip out a book every two or three years does not work for <laughs> particularly for a younger audience who's impatient and, and used to being able to get their content on demand. So, you know, even for, for, um, a lot of novelists, self-publishing mm. is kind of the ideal outcome. But again, it really depends. You know, Brian wanted to go with a traditional publisher because Over Deliver is his life's work. You know, it's his magnum opus, and he really wanted to get it in as many hands as possible and have as much reach as possible. And so going with Hay House was kind of a perfect um, option for him because they have a direct response element in their business already. And so it's kind of a blending of the worlds. He he got a lot of use as he wanted to have and and had a lot of flexibility there. But you know, for for most people I think going the traditional publishing route is very time consuming and it's very it's still very stratified. Um, yeah, it's not a democratized industry like some others are. And so there's a lot of upside to retaining the control of it yourself. Laura, what about um, different approaches you've seen for selling, like actually selling, meaning, you know, you see people do um, free plus shipping or maybe they l release it for 99 cents for a week. What are the different approaches you've seen that have worked and all of them are different for actually uh, I don't know, you know, pricing and, and releasing to get to bestseller or whatever, whatever the goal is. So this is really dependent on the purpose of the book for you. So if your goal is to just sell as many books as possible, then I'd say, you know, launch free or, or cheap, um, keep that price point low for a couple of days, do a big, big, big push to all of your audience and network and everything to get that initial sales velocity going, you know, do a pre-launch so that you get a big spike in sales because pre-launch sales count the day that you launch. They're mm. not accumulated over time. They all count that first day. So if you can get like a big kind of avalanche effect the first day, then that's good for the velocity. But if you are looking to say use the book as a positioning tool then probably the free or 99 cent deal is not the right play for you you know if the book is normally going to sell at 50 dollars or something you know you're you're really using it as like an authority tool you don't want to have it really cheap up front because that completely ruins the the positioning of it um i would say that free plus shipping offers are useful if you have the wherewithal to manage it basically to do that you need to handle all of the sales yourself so you would need to order um, the copies of the book and have your team fulfill those orders or there are some printers who will integrate with amazon and do the fulfillment for you um, but you know it takes a lot of heavy lifting to get those arrangements set up and it's it's slow and it, there's a lot of failure points um, so i think Free plus shipping kind of sounds great, but it's <laughs> there's a lot of downside Logistics. to it. Yeah, the the upside, of course, is that you get people's details, and you know they've also made a direct purchase from you, which you know you can kind of ladder them up a sequence of other purchases, which is always good. Um, so again, it really depends on what the purpose of the book is. Um, I think price strategy is an interesting one. Um, you can you can indicate a lot about what a person should think about a book by how it's priced. So if you price it very low, probably people are not gonna take it very seriously. If you price it very high, then you'd better have some pretty good stuff in there. Um, it's, you know, you will orient people to the type of book that it is by how it's priced and also how it's fulfilled. So if you can't get it on Amazon, people are going to be like, huh, that's weird. Um, but, you know, maybe you have a very loyal audience and you really only care about promoting your business to that audience, in which case the free plus shipping really makes sense and not having it available anywhere else gives it that exclusivity and, and that kind of anticipation. So there's, I mean, 
there are as many different ways to market books as there are authors and yeah. audiences. And it really does depend on what the goal of the book is. And so this is why I'm so bullish on being clear about the strategy, how it's going to fit into the rest of your marketing ecosystem. You know, you really want to have it dialed in so that your every piece around launching the book supports that single goal. Mm -hmm. So I want to talk about yours. How to write this book. What should people know about this? (laughs) That book is the distillation of everything I've learned about writing books about business. Hmm. So not everybody is going to be able to work with me. Obviously, I have a limited amount of time. Um, It takes several months for me to write a book. Um, And so I don't want that to be the limiting factor on how many entrepreneurs get their stories out there. Hmm. And For a lot of people, the process of writing a book is just very daunting because you don't know where to start. It's got this kind of big, like, cultural weight around it. And, you know, people kind of, again, psych themselves out about doing it. And so I wanted to make a very, very detailed, very um, practical guide to doing it. So you could read that book, follow every step, and you would end up with the same outcome that I would get. um, It's very thorough. I mean, you even have a part that's dealing with ISBNs, you know, it's like it's that. <laughs> well, no, but someone who's writing a book, when they get to that um, point, they're like, what What the heck do I do with this? I mean, it's a total, it's, it, it's a, you know, um, a pothole in the road for someone who's yeah, trying to write yeah, a book. Exactly. It's a, I mean, it's for most failure. people who, you know, don't care about writing, that's boring. But for someone who's trying to get it to completion, it's, you know, necessary. Yeah, what's, for what's sure. something and there are in here? So what's many some, little things like that. Yeah, what's something in here that mentally is, is one of the biggest hang-ups for people for writing a book? What have you found? There are a couple. Um, yeah. First is finding the time. Totally. Um, there's a lot. Uh, like obviously, for an entrepreneur running their own business, the business doesn't stop because you decide to write a book, and so it takes a bit of doing to make the time to do the writing. And so, you know, I talk a lot about finding a routine and a rhythm that is going to work for you. Um, Talk a lot as well about keeping your psychology in check because there's this kind of whole thing about writing that it's super hard and that you're going to suffer and it's going to be awful and, you know, you're just going to hate your life for the whole time. But it doesn't have to be like that. And you know, I really don't think that it should be like that. And so I wanted to kind of give people some tools for their own behavior and psychology to make it a productive and and positive experience rather than something that they just suffer through. Um, But also things like dealing with the editing, like people get stuck in editing all the time because you go through this huge process of writing your first draft and you get to the end of the draft and you feel like you're done there's a like a natural sort of stop point there um, because you've done the thing, you know, it's all out of you, but you can't publish that first draft. <laughs> like, it's just going to be a mess. A lot of it, there's going to be typos, there's going to be threads that go nowhere. There's going to be irrelevant material. So you have to go back and go through the editing process. Like editing is where a good book is made. Hmm. And so I really spend a lot of time helping explain why that is and sort of trying to show the benefits of it, but also not minimizing how, how much internal resource that is, is likely to demand of somebody. Um, I think that's kind of one of the biggest issues is like not knowing at the beginning what that sequence of events has to be, not anticipating that you have to go back to the start in editing is where so many people just stop. You know, that's Mm. why there are so many first drafts in people's desk drawers. Right. they just stop at that um laura so last question i always and people should check out laura is and and check out your website and what you're working on and um where can people find the podcast also so uh, find on the website the or podcast, is there a separate domain uh yeah there will be links up there but the uh the 
new podcast is called Business of Writing. Um, so the website for that is going to be businessofwritingpodcast.com. Um, I'll be interviewing writers from all different disciplines there. So ghostwriters, journalists, content marketers, copywriters, academics, um, all kinds of stuff and finding out how they um, run the business side of their writing career. Hmm. Uh, so so you, I- you could find that at lauraiswriting.com. And so last question Laura, and thank you, this has been awesome, Um, is I always ask as an Inspired Insider, what's been a low moment, a challenging moment, and then what's been a proud moment on the flip side? Um, I think a low moment, certainly early on, realizing that my big great idea was actually something that nobody wanted. Hmm. Um, You know, writing nutrition for normal people is not... (laughs) not exciting enough (laughs) so that was it was really painful to realize like I am a total beginner at this and I have no idea what I'm doing and it's daunting to realize how little you know about a field um so that was that was certainly I remember I was traveling in Asia at the time and just like sitting on my bed in my like tiny rented apartment being like what have I done (laughs) like Mm. this was terrible um but you know since then I think I like I think I needed that moment because it kind of got my ego in the right place and um, helped me realize like this doesn't happen unless you get the right people around you and get the right mm-hmm. education. Um, the reality is at that point though, I mean you still have to eat, right? So how do you make sure. ends meet when <laughs> something you're doing isn't working? Well, at that point, I there were this was sort of in the age of content farms, so I was just writing like dozens of articles every week that I cared nothing about. Just hustling. Just just like writing every about everything that someone would pay me for, basically. Um, yeah, I think everybody goes through a moment where there's like a yeah, you just got to pay the bills. Um, mm. Fortunately, that phase did not last too long because um, I realized like I will just burn out and die if I keep doing this like <laughs> you know you can't write for 12 hours a day and not burn out like it just doesn't go that way um so I think the kind of flow on of that moment was that I got so exhausted that I was forced to find a better way um and my, the what is that saying necessity is the mother of invention so that was certainly that mm. moment for me um and all it took was getting one client who thought like, oh, yeah, I could use some content. Um, and I think just getting that first one was enough that it like pulled me out of the kind of depressive, Despair, depressive right. date yeah. <laughs> and, and made me realize like it was possible to do this if I was just diligent. Um, I guess a really proud moment was, I mean, this is very recent, but at Titans this past uh April, we were in Cleveland together and, and Brian was sort of talking about over deliver up in front of everybody and he sort of held it up and he just he just looked so happy that that book is done and that it's out in the world and I just felt like, yeah, this is what it's about. Mm. Like, I helped him and, it, you know, he's, he's just got the most amazing store of knowledge. He's just so accomplished and has such a great strategic mind that I'm really, really proud to have enabled him to mm. get that out to, to oh, more people. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, you know, had him as one of my slides um, in my talk about 100 zero and and just giving and not expecting anything in return. And, yeah. and at least five people came up to me. One's like, oh, I just read that on the plane ride over. Or, the, you know, uh, there were multiple people in the room that had it and they were in the middle of reading it. So you're, you know, what you've, you both have created and is touching people beyond what you even know about. So yeah, thank you. No, that makes me super proud. <laughs> yeah. So thank you, Laura. This has been great. Everyone, check out lauraiswriting.com. Check out her work. Check out the podcast. Very appreciative. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeremy. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire. Came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.